Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this fourth Sunday in Advent as we come closer and closer to Christmas. As you know, in the Advent season, we begin with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem where we see the theme of the church here is that Jesus was born to die. And then we spend two weeks, in a sense, hunkering down and thinking about repentance, thinking about the darkness of our sins. As the days grow darker and darker, we begin to focus on judgment. And John certainly has a judgment message. And the passages from Matthew 3 and Matthew 11 certainly remind us of that. But now we can begin to anticipate the joy of Christmas. And in the first year, uh, in the uh, Ma Matthew series A, we have the text of the, really, the, the announcement of the birth of Jesus uh, to, jo to Joseph, uh, Jesus' father, in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now, I want to begin by looking very carefully here at the structure, like I always like to do. And I think you can see here, right away, that the structure that we're looking at here in, in, in this text, has this opening verse, verse 18, okay, where um, this word here I've got highlighted in yellow. Those of you who have had Dr. Scare know very well that, that this is, of course, you know, the same word that is used of Genesis, and that this is now the new Genesis. And this Genesis here now is a Genesis that is going to be the Genesis of the new Adam, the new Adam, and the beginning of the new and second creation. And in a sense here, we see the last link in the genealogy that gives birth to the very person of the Messiah. And in the genealogy, you know how it goes, Joseph, Mary, and then the Messiah. And here we have the reverse, Messiah, Mary, and Joseph. What we realize is that Scripture is sort of like a tire. The story keeps getting retold. It's the same story, but in a little different way. And of course, the main figure is always Jesus, and here he is in blue. We start the text with Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm always interested in the person's framework, who's in the text, and obviously, Jesus Christ, notice the Christ, is the first and most important person. There is going to be Mary, but in this text, more importantly, Joseph, and then finally, the angel. So, to, to, to begin, we have this, this really sort of marvelous opening for the text. Now, the second part is to be found here in verses 18b and 19. And this is where we see that Mary and Joseph are introduced and we have the problem, the divorce. So, you know, this part now, and, and we're going to see that, that in a way, we, we kind of can walk through this text sort of addressing this problem. Um, I love the way in which um, Matthew lays this out, you know. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, now that's, that's a, a very simple statement, but it clearly indicates that they have not had yet relations, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a reference to the virgin birth here. So the, the virgin birth is in play right away. Um, I mean, and here's the main verb. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, I mean, whoa. Look at here. We, we start with Jesus Christ, and here we have the Spirit. You know? Um, now, th this shows, you know, how her virginity could be possible. And those of you who have heard me on this in Luke, the way in which she conceives according to Luke, and I think according to Luther, is that she conceives when the voice 
comes into her ear. She, she conceives through her ear, through the voice. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so does the incarnation. Comes by hearing. Joseph, her husband, notice his pedigree here. Righteous, you know, and, and not willing to cause her shame. You know, put her to shame. I, I, this is such an important concept in, in the New Testament. The whole honor and shame, you know, goes back to the purity code. You know, I mean, I, I will refrain from saying too much here about this, but I mean, it, it is, especially in connection with righteous. Notice it starts with righteous and it ends with shame. So, I mean, what, what we have here is, is the situation where Mary you know, is, is put into the category perhaps of shame and Joseph is the righteous one. So, I mean, you, you've got this r remarkable, you know, sort of um, juxtaposition of the situation with her pregnancy. And l look at what Joseph, he, he dissolved to lose her. There's the word for divorce, quietly, you know. Um, th this, this is a... a an example of his righteousness, of his mercy, of his grace. I mean, supposedly she could have been put to death. So, I mean, this is really a remarkable moment where we see how Joseph, the kind of the unsung hero, is so important in the text. Now, th there's a great deal, I think, of Joseph typology between Joseph in the Old Testament and Joseph in the New. Um, in, in a sense, they are redemptive figures, almost Christ figures. They forgive. Um, they're, both in, uh, they're, they're both people. One concludes Genesis. One begins the new Genesis. The, the, the focus, as I said, on this story is Joseph. Um, and, and we find salvation in, 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 uh, in the, the coming of Joseph the announcement to them in dreams. Both of them experience dreams. That salvation is announced to them by means of these dreams. So, so there are some remarkable things here that I think we have to kind of focus on in terms of Joseph. This would be the time to talk about Joseph. <clears throat> I always say this, you know, March 19th is the Feast of Joseph in Spain, and it's also Father's Day. There's something kind of right about that. You know, because Joseph is the sort of the, the, the great example of the father, you know, human father. Now, the next part of the text is verses 20 and 21, where we have the announcement of the angel. And here is where we really get into the, the heavy duty kind of theological language that is so important for a text like this. It begins that, you know, Joseph there is considering these things. And then, idu, behold, that, that wonderful word, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream saying, and look at the pedigree, Joseph, son of David. So there you can really see how, um, how important, you know, Joseph is in the genealogy. I mean, this, again, puts us back into the Genesis, the Genesis, you know. Um, think also of, of the fact that here you see Joseph is a redemptive figure. He's a son of David. Um, when he, the angel says, do not fear, he's, re, he's talking about the fear of pollution, you know, of being unclean. And I've always said that this language in the scriptures you know, in the New Testament, is almost the equivalent of an absolution. To take Mary as your wife will not render you unclean. So you, you are worthy, you know, to be considered holy, to stand in God's presence, you know, if you do this. Take Mary your wife. And then in the, in the, in the yellow there is, is the statement so clearly um, ab about the conception, for that which is conceived in her, and notice here, that I mentioned holy, it's right here, is holy by the Holy Spirit. 
So the, the Holy Spirit now for the second time comes in. You know, what is holy? The Spirit. Um, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable statement, not only of the, this, this moment of holiness, but also the fact that there is this incredible, you know, um, sense that the Spirit here is acting in the conception as, you know, the, 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 the Genesis now begins anew. The new Adam comes in. And then the announcement, she will conceive a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Now, here's the first title. We're going to see that there are going to be three titles here. You know, and they're, they're all so important. There's going to be Jesus, and there's going to be Emmanuel. It's only two titles, sorry, two titles. And Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is referred to at the end, so there's a frame. I, that's what I was thinking of. Anyway, um, but Jesus, and, and here's Jesus defined, and, and, you know, you could really preach your sermon on this. This is what's born in Bethlehem. This one will save his people from their sins. Now, every Israelite knew that this was the meaning of Jesus. So here, here you see that, you know, just like Mary was catechized at the Annunciation as to who the child in her womb would be. Joseph just gets really, in a sense, two names, Jesus and Emmanuel, but this is enough. This is the Savior. This is the one who has come to save people from their sins. Now, what's beautiful about this, and this, this is just kind of one of the remarkable things about Matthew, and I hope I can get it all in here. Let's see here, is that the announcement to the angel is paralleled here with the prophetic witness in verses 22 and 23. And I think you, you're going to be able to see here how, how beautiful the parallelism is here. To start with, this thing here, for that was conceived is holy by the Spirit, is here paralleled with, and I've got it down here, whoops, sorry about that, I need a color here. I've got it paralleled here with the statement, behold, the virgin will conceive in her womb. And then you see, you will, you will give birth to a son, okay, and here you will call his name Jesus, and they will call his name Emmanuel. And then the explanation of the Jesus is he will save his people from their sins. And the explanation here of Emmanuel is that God is with us. Now, here you have the angel. And here you have, this is to fulfill the word of the prophet. You know, here you have the prophet. So here you have the New Testament announcement to Joseph in a dream, and here you have the Old Testament affirmation that this is in fact exactly what the, 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 the Old Testament was, was about, you know? Now, I, I love the fact that they, they call him Emmanuel here. So Jesus and Emmanuel, here are the two, and it means God with us. Now, there are all kinds of, I mean, if this is the incarnation, which it is, the Savior, and atonement, when he's called God with us, I mean, from a New Testament perspective, from our perspective, this is a, re a, re a reference to the sacramentality of Jesus in our midst, that God is continually with us. Now, I'm going to show you below in a minute, that this is a language. Well, why don't we just do that right now? But I mean, I, I just, th th these parallels are just beautiful. And I mean, you can see how wonderfully the, the, um, the evangelist is, is shaping this. Um, but I, I do put here at the very bottom the three places where this language of, of God with us is so important. I mean, 
Look, look at this. And they occur at particular times, you know, that I think are so significant. Um, where two or three are gathered together in my name. That's presence, of course. There I am, the ego a me, in the midst of you. Now, God with us. There it is. You know, in the midst of you. Now, this occurs halfway through the gospel. And then at the very end. And behold, I am, ego a me, with you, you know, always to the end of the ages. Now, and, I've, and I've always taken this as, as being a reference to his ongoing present with us Eucharistically. So Emmanuel, God with us, you know, I mean, we usually think of the gathering here in the midst, you know, in his name. And here, the Eucharistic gathering. I mean, it's, it's quite a remarkable thing that's going on here in terms of the presence of God in Christ and his ongoing presence among us. I mean, in a sense, that's what Christmas is all about. Finally, I think we, we need to say, of course, a few things about the last two verses, even though they, they seem to be, you know, I don't want to say prosaic, but they don't, they don't say too much to us. Um, it kind of finishes out the story. But, but I think it's important the way in which the, the evangelist shapes this. First of all, it, it's, it's very clear here that what he wants us to see here is the fact that he ends with the name Jesus, you know. Um, and they called his name Jesus, you know. Now that is an echo back to the very beginning, and that's where that frame is. I'll maybe put it all up again if we can get it on there. But, I mean, that he ends with Jesus. And the, the reference to giving birth, I put it in green so you can see they're all in green. You know, three times it said <clears throat> that they will bear a son. But here, here, just going back to the beginning here, here you can see Joseph, the obedient one, waking up from his dream. He does exactly what the angel told him. He takes Mary, his wife. Here's that wonderful biblical language. So this is a second time to indicate that they had not come together as man and wife. He does not know her until she bears a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, in a way, if you, if you look at the whole text, the whole text is about the fact that what is born in Bethlehem, can we get it all in there? Yeah, you can. What is born in Bethlehem is this child, Jesus. And, I, I mean, I, I just love the way, you know, well, first of all, look at, give birth to a son, give birth to a son, give birth to a son. Jesus, Jesus, and what is in the center? Emmanuel, God with us. Um, this, this, this is what I would preach on. I would preach on the names. I would preach on the significance of the names. I would preach on what they mean to us now as we come on the brink of Christmas. Now, as you know, we, we have a week until Christmas because Christmas is on a Sunday, I believe, this year. So, I mean, there is great anticipation. Here you could probably sing, you know, some, some Christmas songs. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. I think people are, are in, in need of this at this point. And what a wonderful way in this last week before Christmas to think about what it is that we're going to celebrate on that most holy day. That Jesus is the one who comes because he has come to save us from our sins. That Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us.